starting early today, huh? Yeah. Let's whoop it on. Under promise, over deliver. Woo! Right? We're competitive like that. <laughs> like, well, have you ever heard uh, Vince Lombardi time? Have you ever heard that saying? Uh, it's like 10 minutes early for everything. Like that's Lombardi, Oh, it's like the Lombardi military. Time, right? yeah. 15 minutes before the 15 minutes. Yeah, until you're an hour early. Yeah, so if, if the formation starts at 1300, 1, 1 p.m., right? Then you're supposed to, you got to be at the formation at 1245, but then you've got to be there 15 minutes before the 15 minutes, right? So, squad leader wants which to means you really got to be there at, at 1230, yeah. which means that you've got to then show up at 12.15, because you gotta make sure there's no, what you know, anything crazy that happens between 12.15 and 12.30, which means that you've got a plan to show up at noon, because what if could something happens? Yeah, there could be gate traffic. Yeah, there could be gate traffic, because everyone's coming back from Zorba's, whatever, <laughs> right? The Thai, the Thai yeah. pepper. Yeah, and yeah. you know, it's just a mad dash for the gate, and you just never know <laughs> what's gonna happen. And then if you show up late, they drag into the office and they say, bye-bye, go away. This is where hurry up and wait came. It's a real thing. It's a real thing. I read Catch-22 too. Oh, man. I read Catch-22, listen to this, I read Catch-22 when I was deployed to Iraq. Yeah. And it was like, why am I, <laughs> why am I reading this right now? I don't need this, I don't need this kind of sarcasm and bitterness in my life. Yeah. I read, uh, I read a bunch of weird books. In Iraq as well. I read some normal ones too, but I read uh, a bunch of um, Vonnegut mm -hmm. uh, over there. So I read Slaughterhouse Five, and I also read um, uh, Hunter S. Thompson's book, Fear and Loathing on the Campaign Trail of Seventy Two. Mm -hmm. Have you read any Hunter S. Thompson? It's like all gone. Only though. like a little bit of uh, articles. So much like satire and sarcasm and stuff in those books, and it's not it's not good when you kind of see the world going on around you through the lens of Catch-22 or Slaughterhouse-Five or, or whatever, but anyway. This is not a show about literature. No. Today we want to talk about competition. Yeah. That's why we started five minutes early. Yeah. Because Jason and I <laughs> are mildly competitive. Secretly sometimes. Yeah. It, throughout the course of our lives, right? Secretly. So let me ask you this. Have you ever pretended, wished you were less competitive or pretended overtly to be less competitive or to conceal the true, uh, the true, uh, I don't know, depth of your competitive nature? Have you ever found like it was important to do that or tried to do that? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's not exactly the, like the, board the perfect games answer. Like family or whatever? First off, I hate board games. I hate sitting down. I'm insufferable, right? <laughs> Like put me at a table I don't any of that. and say, hey, we're gonna sit and play a board game. First, if I am competitive, but like what what trumps that is my hatred of boredom, right? So sitting down and just I, I just I like to move. So I'd have to I'd have to be really tired to do a board game. Um, also family there were there were, the there were lots of family day. fights over trivial pursuit growing up. <laughs> so it may have scarred me, you know, a little bit. That's right? good that your family had fights over trivial pursuit. I mean, it's very intellectual of you guys. I mean big fights, right? <laughs> like look it up in the yeah, encyclopedia. Yeah, big fights. And and then <laughs> and then you know, my family's obviously different than M's family and come to find out that Emily as a kid would she would arrange sort of trivial pursuit nights. And, and in between, before the Trivial Pursuit night started, she would study all of the cards in the I Trivial Pursuit game. I believe every word of that. I believe every word of that. <laughs> I mean, like, that, that is a sociopathic competitive <laughs> person right there, right? I mean, studying I, yeah, the yeah, cards, it's brilliant. We should have her on the it's show It's brilliant. Golly. Yeah. Talk about competition. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, the even game. in the early days of GORUCK, there was... I mean, I'm looking actually at the picture right there, that picture of beer from the 48th state of my Go Ruck Summer Tour 2010. It was sort of, hey, the challenge, the Go Ruck Challenge, just drink a beer and come on, show one up. It might hurt a little bit, no big deal, right? You don't really need to train really hard, you just sort of show up, you know? And the joke was is that that's what I would have told kind of a really competitive person who knew who knew how that's to train, some, some and another SF guy yeah. or someone, something like that, uh, an endurance junkie or, or whatever, who could have sort of just rolled into it, but, mm -hmm. you know, such is the case that we had to sort of roll that back a little bit. So I became sort of the, the fixture or the face of the sort of, hey, you always look cool, it's no big deal, right? Like, I'm fine if people think that at Go Ruck, you know, we, we sort of make it look easy, you know? Meanwhile, it's, it's a lot of work, right, behind the scenes. 
But nobody wants to project that. Nobody wants to say, you know, one of my big, one of my biggest pet peeves is when people say, I'm so busy, right? I'm so, last week, right? so busy, right? It just doesn't work, right? It's sort of like saying, but, but somehow that's acceptable in saying, hey, I'm so competitive, I want to win, right? That's not acceptable. Less acceptable than it used to be. Yeah. Like, not, like Mad Men era, like then it was, Bring more, it back. it was more acceptable. But not it's, every Johnny deserves a trophy, you know? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, if everything is special, nothing is special. And like... We, I think we both, we both really value things that are great. Or I mean, I even value people and or organizations that strive to be great in earnest. Not like I want to be great or I'm I'm special because I'm here or I deserve to be treated like a prince or what. Like I hate that stuff. But like, God. who's the last person that told you they wanted to be treated like a prince? I think princess would probably be more. <laughs> at it, but. Either way, there, but there are a lot of people, there's there's a fair amount of entitlement in the world now, and I'm not like here to like get off my lawn, get a, like all old man, Clint Eastwood, Grand Torino on this, but. <laughs> Great movie. But, <laughs> yeah. but, what I, but what I'll say any any day of the week is that there, there is a fair amount of entitlement out there. I think there are too many people, maybe the, maybe the percentage isn't that big, I don't know, but I, I have bumped into a lot of people that feel like success can come quickly and just because they've started their company or they've built an app or they've trained for five minutes that they just expect for success to come. And I, and I think that if you're not truly competitive, you find out the hard way and sometimes pretty quickly that things just don't work that way. And the people I've seen that have been really successful, you know, it's not just that they have less entitlement and they know they have to earn it. It's that they're just so damn competitive. <laughs> that in the face of whatever obstacles they bump into, they just refuse to lose or they refuse to quit. And you can probably take that to the extreme too, but you and I have had a lot of conversations about this actually, uh, where all the really successful people we know, maybe it, it's looked easy for them, but they, they've hustled so hard. Like, they, they didn't just really sit around, they didn't just walk around Broadway all day and just wait for someone to find them with the right haircut on, you know? Yeah, there was no like, sitting at a cafe and getting discovered. Like, Everyone I know that's had any level of success has really busted their ass at it and worked hard. And a lot of them, I guess I can't say all of them, but the vast majority of them I would also label as extremely competitive. And that manifests itself in a lot of different ways. Like if we want to talk about competition today and like what that actually looks like, I think maybe the first step is to do what we try to always do, which is acknowledge that there's some nuance, there's some subtlety to it, that it's not black and white, it's not a competitive person looks like this and, and doesn't look so like that. So what does competitive mean? It's, it, that's a, a broad definition, but I would say, and this is viewing it very much through the, my, the lens of my own life, I mean, I think it's a, a deep, a deeply rooted desire to win or to improve um, whatever form that takes. And so when I was a younger person, I very much was competitive with other people around me. Like my level of success or my level of winning had much more to do with how I was doing relative to the people around me. You yeah, know, the YMCA basketball league or Yeah, you're in third soccer, grade and you're running yeah. the mile. Yeah. Like I wanted to be the fastest kid in the third grade at running the mile. And that to me was winning. That was was being competitive. I played team sports, you know, so winning, scoreboard, right? Like that was important to me. You know, as I got older and I realized life had a lot of other aspects to it besides team sports and, and you know, grades and things. I've had to change that a little bit. And now I compete with myself. I mean, I have, you know, I want to beat my PR in running the 5K or clean and jerk or whatever it is. Um, so the object of my competition has probably changed a lot, but the the temperature of the the blast furnace of competition going on in my belly has not waned at all, whether I was shooting against guys on my team, playing against other kids on the soccer field, or like even now if I go run a 5K, like so is it only physical? Is it only, is it only sort of, you know? No, no. I mean, and again, I think if you're truly competitive, you, you can, almost cannot help yourself but to compete in almost every facet of life. And I think that can be damaging taken to too much of an extreme, but I think you can also, or at least again, my experience has been, uh, I have stopped trying to sort of deny or acknowledge like the true depth of my competitive nature because it is deep. 
I've, mm -hmm. And instead, I've just tried to be better and more mature about how I focus it. You know what I mean? Like, I'm, I'm holding a bazooka no matter what. And I can't turn it into a pistol. Like, like I have a bazooka of competitive drive in, inside me, and I just can't be blasting it in the same ways I was when I was 8 or 9 or 14 years old. Um, I've got to figure out better ways to do Social it. Social norms know? and yeah, like stuff I, like well, that. Well, I'd like to have right? friends. I'd like to stay married. <laughs> you know, I'd like to keep my job. Like, there's all these things that actually turn out to be kind of important in life. But... But to answer your question, I think being competitive really means that you have an innate, you have a sort of intrinsic drive to win or to improve or be better in whatever form that takes. I don't think it really depends so much on the activity, whether it's getting better grades, running faster, winning in a boxing match or an MMA or any of that stuff. I mean, I think it's either it's, it's there and it tends to just come out in whatever your chosen endeavor happens to be. Or all of them, as the case may be. So is it sort of, I mean, nature, nurture, what, what's the, I mean, is this, because everyone says, oh, I'm pretty competitive, right? Some people. Yeah. Well, some people will try to say they're not as competitive as they are, too. Like, I think it's, yeah. it, the pendulum's almost swung to the point, and I've, I've been guilty of that, where I've tried to sort of not let on to how competitive I am, but then as soon as we start doing whatever it is we're doing, like, we did the Battle of the Rut Clubs this weekend. Yeah, I watched you eat one of your own teammates so that yeah, you guys could... Do a little I'll better. Just run people over if I have to. <laughs> <laughs> that was kind of the impetus for having having the show today and talking about yeah. about competition. But um, you can't. It, it's just very hard to turn off. And I think I'm a, I'm a grown up. I, I can see the bigger picture of things. So I'm not gonna lose my mind and scream at people trying to win the battle of the Ruck Clubs. But I think you could also see as a third party observer was pretty competitive yeah, you could, I, you know, throughout the day, right? I could sort of, so it, basically the and event- And you were too, just to be fair. Yeah, so yeah. basically the event started out with an hour of deck of cards or so, and it was, it, it sucked, it was bad. Then it transitioned to what, a ruck relay, and then there was some other stuff, but- a, Yeah, four mile ruck with coupons. So like, yeah. you know, one of your guys, SP, he's still alive, thankfully, because we still need scars repairs done. He was struggling a little bit at the beginning. Blaine actually ate him. Right? It's like, hey, we're going to go faster if I just eat you. So they just, you've seen the movie Alive, they did that, right? Except SP was, was Protein. still, it was great. It was alive, you know, like it was, it was something. It was great, right? And then we get into the, the ruck portion, which was, you know, you have my team had seven. At that point, your team had seven too because you yep. ate SP. That's right. So then we, <laughs> so we had, a, you know, an extra 30 pounds and a, an extra sandbag per team. It was like just scorched earth down the beach. I'm like, you know, very basic. Four we're not moving. Time. We're not moving fast enough. And I'm going to my people like, okay, give me your ruck, right? <laughs> okay, I already, you know, it's like, come on, let's yeah. go, right? And then teams start passing us, even though some people, like, we had people without rucks on and without, like, they, I, I just, I couldn't. I, I, it was hard for me. Well, we passed you, and I it was said, hard Jason, for me. on a scale of 1 to 10, how competitive are you at rucking? And you said 12. <laughs> well, at least that's an honest answer. Yeah, I mean. An honest, yeah. You know? But, you know, I couldn't. I was so sore. My hips were so sore for two days from like, running. And I don't recommend running with a rucksack on, but we were competing. So it was different than training, right? We were competing. And you're running with 100 pounds on your back. You had a sort like, of the 40, shuffle. 40 pounds yeah. with the ruck and a 60-pound sandbag. And... It's suboptimal, you know, for especially for a 165 pound dude. But you just it, the switch goes on, and you just start going. And yeah, I'm not not embarrassed or ashamed of any of it at this point. And I, and honestly, I think our community at least values our ability to be competitive in those environments because it would be easy enough for us to show up and just sort of mail it in and say like we're just here for the community. We're just here to kind of participate and show our faces, but you and I both, and, and really everyone from GORUCK HQ was, the GORUCK HQ teams did very well at the Battle of the Rock Clubs, by the way. Yeah. And especially considering we didn't even know we who was coming until day the day of, of and all like, that. I mean, we took third and fifth out of what, 11? Yeah. But we, um, so. we, we got after it, and I think people appreciate the fact that you're willing to show up and throw down and compete, regardless of whether you win or lose, but you know, your ability to kind of show up and strap it on is, is big. Yeah. In our community, anyway. Yeah, I mean, and it's sort of, our community is always based on sort of spe our special forces roots. And it, it's kind of like that. I mean, if you're, if you're in a special forces company, there's a headquarters element, and then there are six special forces teams. 
right? And teams basically hate other teams. Like, I'm better than your team. It's brotherly love, right? You hate, brotherly you hate love. them until you, yeah. until you love them. That's of course, yeah. you know? I mean, well, you know, downrange you love each other, but you, yeah. you've got these sort of friendly, friendly things that go on, and when you're in the rear, when you're, you know, in this country, and there's lots of things like you know who's going to win the stress shoot, who's going to win the company shoot, who's going to yeah, yeah, who's going to do all of those things? Who's gonna, and who, it's more than that though. Who's going to get good mission? Yeah. Well, like a one good, thing. A good J set comes down the pike, or you deploy, and there's different fire bases you can go to. Yeah. You want for your team to get the toughest mission, because if you don't, that implies that you're not the best team. Yeah. In the and game. how do you do that? You win. Yeah. You win when you're here. You just consistently win. And that's how you do it. So a team that can figure out how to win more, be more competitive against other teams, wins. And, and to do that, within the team, you have competitions as well. Right? I mean, Very much you so. love yeah. the guys on your team, always. But, you know, I don't like buying cases of beer if I don't have to. You know? Yeah. And, and so if you lose the shoot at the end of the day, you, you owe a case of beer. That's the deal. And, yeah. you know, so shoot better. Shoot better costs you less. There's always... That's one of the best things about SF, though. I mean, and I know that you did not have to serve in the man's army uh, in the 82nd or the 1st Cav or whatever, but one of the things that I, I picked up on very quickly when I got into SF and I loved about it was that it pays to be a winner. Yeah, it does. That, that, that was not a phrase that was ever uttered in the army that I came from. You know, mm -hmm. I never, I never heard that until I got into SF, and I remember being in the Q course, maybe even at selection, and doing some, you know, running relays or doing log and rifle PT or, yeah. or you know any of those things. Yeah. And for the cadre to say, hey, we're going to do this drill, we're going to run this thing, it pays to be a winner, and I'm like, is this some kind of trick? And it wasn't. You know, if your team won the relay and the log PT or whatever you were doing, like you could sit out the next drill. And yeah. the teams, like, I remember being in a combatives course. I went to see. You could some, throw up in total and utter peace and quiet. They wouldn't even yeah, bother you. Yeah, off to the side. <laughs> Catch a breather. Rinse your mouth out. Um, I went to some combatives instructor course one time, and you, you paired up and fought. Like, that was, like, on the last day of the course or whatever. You paired up and you fought to submission. That was the only way the fight could end, was submission. And if you lost, it wasn't like a winner's bracket to see who the best fighter was in the class. Mm-hmm. It just continued along the loser's bracket to see who the worst fighter in the class was. <laughs> I'm serious. And so you paired off and you fought. And if you won, you were out. And if you lost, you went back in the bracket. Hmm. And then you had to keep fighting until you won. And your only way out of the bracket was to win. And there's like 40 guys in this class. So you I mean you, you break up, there's 20 fights to start. And then it comes to 10 yeah. fights and five fights. I mean, it, it's a long day if you don't win a fight. But the motivation is, look, win, win your fight. And you don't have to fight anymore. And if you don't win, you got to keep fighting. Yeah. And eventually, you'll fight somebody who's not that good at combatives because you know you're getting lower in the bracket. And I, I got paired up with a guy that was forty or fifty pounds heavier than me, probably. And I was like, "Shit, this this sucks." But I didn't want to fight twice. And he and I had the longest fight. There were still there were second round fights going on while we were still in our first round fight. <laughs> and I eventually, I think, just through superior fitness, I was not a better fighter. I don't Endurance. think. Endurance. I just I was able to keep him from choking me out or submitting me for so long. I was on the bottom, on the losing end of the fight, the whole fight basically. Yeah. And then, in the last thirty seconds, was able to like get over, get a choke in, and he finally was just like, screw this, I'll, I'll just beat the next guy in five minutes yeah. or whatever, and I got out of it. But I just remember, that was before I earned my tap. That was in the Q course, mm -hmm. and I was like, this is real. But it should be that way, right? I mean, if the game you're in is special forces, and the game you're playing downrange is life or death, it's a war, we should probably be incenting our soldiers to win fights. And I had never yeah. seen anything like that until that time, and I was like, I have no problem with this. I don't care if the guy that, that loses is like the, the biggest loser or whatever. Like, I, I care about his feelings to the extent that he's gotta carry on in the course, but I'd rather win my fight and get out of the bracket, right? Yeah, win and be done. Win or quit, right? Yeah. So how did you feel after you, you guys, so you guys were in that second and third place competition 
He, he seemed pretty mad. Uh, you know what I was mad about, if I can really be honest? Yeah. We actually won. I think you actually I'm not trying tied. to have tie. Do we tie for first? Yeah, it would have been a tie for first. Okay. Except you ate your participant. <laughs> So right? our point total at the end of the day was hey, oops, first or tied oops, first. one of our team members can't keep up, so we ate him. Can we just go on and do it faster now? I, well, okay, I, we know where your hang up is here in the whole <laughs> thing. That's been well established at this point. My hang up <laughs> is that at the end of the competition, our team had a point aggregate that either put us in first place or tied for first place, whatever it was. But Instead, they assessed us a penalty or some kind of handicap on one of the events because we only had seven people. But when you look at what that event was, there was no advantage to having fewer people. Well, we um, had seven people the whole time only, and they didn't give us any bonus points. Exactly. Yeah. Including, including the four-mile ruck where you had to carry a 30-pound coupon and a 60-pound coupon, yeah. and you had seven people to spread it amongst instead In of eight. some ways, you might think that that would be better with more people, but what I found out is a lot of times some of the people that were with you Right, we're carrying nothing, and you were waiting on them. So, so depending on your be team, careful, be, be careful works. which you know. Yeah. So anyway, like I, I seriously, it's not it's not that big a deal. But I just remember thinking like we shouldn't even be here today. Yeah, like we should. I watched in the first you place. thinking that. I'm like, oh, I watched God. you thinking that. But I'm really I'm really happy <laughs> for the guys from the uh, Palm Luke Beach MC crew. man. Luke you M put on a hell of a yeah a hell we, of we a show. Yeah. I mean, and in all sincerity, like going going back to my point from before, like I really do love to compete now. I mean, it, genuinely, and I'm not just saying that to make myself feel better. I, I love to compete, and I'm I think in most cases I'm beyond the point where my hatred of losing or my love of winning has been mostly supplanted by my my love of competing. And maybe that's because I'm just not as good at some things I used to be, or or because I want to have friends and you know whatever. Like but, all of us friends, a job, you know, people yeah, that exactly. like us and, you know. But I, I enjoyed <laughs> competing and it really, like, it struck both of us, I think. And we, we, before that event even, but certainly after the event, like, we're looking at ways to incorporate a little bit more sort of friendly competition into some of these GORUCK events because it's fun. And, and what I saw from the GORUCK community, which was actually the, maybe the most heartening thing of all of it, was that in that one event, there was both very intense competition. People were laying themselves out. Like, we had people going hypothermic on the beach, yeah, dragging on. people across the sand. I mean, it was, there yeah. was some screaming and yelling like, let's go, hurry up. There was very intense competition, but there was also an equally intense spirit of support and community and, um, you know, the teams. Uh, it felt about right. Yeah, yeah, it was just, it was really like a very harmonious sort of mix of those two things. And so maybe it was just a special day, but I mean, I think we can capture some of that where people are being pushed, not because the cadre is yelling at them, they were being pushed because there was a level of competition that made them just want to, I mean, I'm not rucking four miles that hard at any go ruck challenge no. ever, unless I'm racing another team. I was pretty you smoked know. at the end of that. I was very smoked mm. and I was very sore the next day from, <laughs> sp- from all that. Oh, if you were only sore for one day, then you beat me by quite a bit. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, glad, I'm glad to hear you admit that, Jason. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Because that's true. But I, I thought it really added something. So that's one of the things I, I wrote on the board that I wanted to talk about if we were going to do a show on competition is, you know, is there a time when it's healthy and is there a time when it's unhealthy? Because we also run a business and we have a lot of other things in our lives, families and, and stuff. And I would guess, but I'd love to hear your, your answer on this. You know, are there times when competition is absolutely vital? Like a sales manager will say competition is critical. Like you got you to pit your people against each other, stack rank them, competition drives performance, that kind of thing. But there are probably also times when it's less beneficial. And maybe cooperation or collective success or whatever you want to call it is more like, what's been your experience with that? Or am I making that up? Is that is that not a thing? And competition is always kind of the rising tide that lifts all boats. Yeah, I don't know. I'm sort of probably the worst person to ask this. I mean, because... I don't think you're a bad Because person every, every, every day there's some type of... It's either... So here, here's the thing. Is... 
When people are here and they work really hard and that's sort of our culture and, and all, that, all that stuff, right? Like, here's the nuance is that you can measure yourself off of your, your time or your revenue target or your goal or whatever it is that you were sort of competing against a time of, uh, people are really hard because life really isn't a, hey, you start here on the same start line and you here's the, here's the finish line and you get to just measure a time. Life doesn't really work like that. So what, what, what I've always kind of done, in my, at least in my own kind of, uh, hey, are we, are, we, are we living up to the dream that, that, are we living up to our potential, what we're capable of, is it's, it's about how hard you fight. And, and that's more of a process than an outcome. And so- Is it, is it though? I mean- Yeah, I mean, there's a I'm, I'm feeling, you, there's a feel, look, it, you know, in, so imagine this, you're, you're in the Q course and some guy is not, he's, he's not quite, he's sort of bottom half performance, right? But he's the guy who's like, you know, he will pass out on a run before he will, you know, stop. He will, you know, he'll, you, you'll do whatever it is, log PT, and he's the one who's vomiting because he's just throwing himself out there with 110%. He's, he's always the guy who's sort of doing a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more. I would rather have that guy that works harder, that's more committed to throwing himself out there than the guy who's just sort of naturally gifted but doesn't really do the, doesn't, have to exert himself or doesn't, or I guess it gets at it attitude based at the say, same I, I time. I think that's nuanced too, though, because I, I, my sentimentally, I agree with you, but I would say practically, there's a point, especially on a thing like a, a special forces team, where there are some guys that no matter how hard they try or how much heart they have, if they're if they're not able to physically, intellectually, uh, you know, meet. The standard. Hey, lots of guys suck at running, Blaine. That's why I brought that example up. You know, running's not the only thing. (laughs) No, for sure. But I guess my point is, I I value effort and I value the process and I value the commitment at a very very high level. And and I think I think I would be willing to make a lot of concessions to have the person who's more committed, harder working, as opposed to someone who's more talented and, and maybe not. Putting in the effort. More talented and lazy or less talented and more committed? It's just not black and white because... But if it, it were... On, it, it, well, it depends on what we're trying to do. If if I need guys on my team to go down range and do a specific mission, or I'm starting a business and I need three or four folks to help me to be successful, you know, I'm not taking a person who can't write code to be my IT person, no matter how hard they work at it or how badly they want to be that last spot on the team. I've got to have someone who yeah. can, who no, can I accomplish get that. the mission. And, you know, downrange is the same thing. Like, if you just can't keep up and you're not going to be able to pull your own weight and you're going to potentially be unsafe on an objective, I mean, no matter how much I love you and how much you're committed, you, at some point you either are able to perform and meet a certain standard or you're not. And that's not a character assessment. It's just a abilities assessment. Mm-hmm. And so what I would love to have are people that are highly competent, highly talented, and extremely hardworking, and have a great attitude, and, and just we, grow, start growing them on trees. Yeah, man. yeah, <laughs> they do exist, though. Um, we're fortunate to know a lot of them. Yeah. So, no, I, I guess I would just I would agree with what you're saying. I, I I can't say anything counter to it, except for the fact that that also is nuanced because there are there are times and places where you need a certain level of competence, a certain level of skill, a certain level of ability, and no matter how much you love someone or how hard they've tried, if they just can't get there. You have to have, especially as a leader, you've got to have the stones to say, "Hey, man, I love you, but this just isn't for you. I just this isn't this isn't the right role. This isn't the right opportunity for you." Mm-hmm. Those are the people you respect, though, right? It's like it's, it's like it's like Rudy, you know, like the you don't always get to play, but you're you're the one that sort of you're on the team because you work the hardest. You you go all out. I mean, you, I mean, is is. Is that competitive? Yeah, it's really competitive. Well, right? here's the thing. That attitude, that competitive spirit will translate to success in other areas. So maybe not everyone's cut out to be a Green Beret or a software engineer. If you have that level of will and drive and competitiveness, it will eventually pay its dividends in some other area of your life or when you find 
kind of what you're looking for. But And Lee asked us before the show started, I thought it was a really good question, or he made kind of a statement, which was that there are some people who won't do things, like they're so competitive that they won't do things that they don't feel they can win at. And that's what I was saying before about at some point you have to learn to love to compete if you really want to grow and you really want to find your your groove because if you just avoid things you can't win at, I would question I would say that you're not actually not as competitive as you think you are. You're just a person that likes to win. And life is not that way. You don't go undefeated in life. And you, the first time someone slaps you around, you take your ball and go home. Yeah, exactly. And I would argue that person's really not truly competitive. That's just a person who likes to win. And I don't know. I don't know that many people who everyone the likes to win, want to win or lose. Everyone right? likes to win. That's exactly. not saying anything, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, to <laughs> me, that's that's a, a when you talk about respect, um, and I think we've said this on the show before, but I'll, I'm happy to say it again. Some of the people that I respect the most in this whole world are the people that are willing to show up and compete, whether it's for a job or in a race or uh, at a military course. Folks who will show up fully committed and they will compete, understanding that they may not win, and you define winning however you like, right? Getting your ranger tab. Yeah, I mean, you, you know, just defined basically medal, almost everybody that ever showed up for these sort of crazy schools, right? I mean, well, sort of. I would say there are there is a percentage of people that have shown up not full. They weren't fully committed to the process, and they didn't show up with the full intention of sticking it out. And, and staying until they're Sorry, dead. any of the people who have passed these schools. Because, yeah. you, like, you know, I showed up. And, like, you, you show up because you want to know if you can meet a standard, but you don't even know what the standard is. Right, or, or you could be completely prepared and capable, and you could, you know, you could roll your ankle really bad. Mm -hmm. You could get hurt on a jump at ranger school, and guess what? You don't graduate. Yeah. But, you know, I, but I have respect for a guy that showed up and was crushing it and, you know, jumped out of the plane during the Florida phase and broke his ankle in half and never never got back like i'm fine with that so you know i think that if you're really competitive then that means in, in my mind anyway a truly competitive person and someone whose competitiveness is actually going to lead them to success and not just like angst and consternation mm -hmm. with their family on board game night um that, don't play board games that's how <laughs> i fight that 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 person is willing to show up knowing they may not win and being okay with it because they they love to compete and they're and to win big you got to bet big big a little bit and that's kind of the Rudy analogy right like to play football at Notre Dame at five foot nothing a hundred nothing yeah. that's a big bet yeah. and he invested a lot of time and energy and a lot of his life into that knowing he may never step between the lines and get to play it down mm -hmm. at Notre Dame but he did it anyway and that's like he's gone on now to have this incredible life and. You know, his kids have all like, gone to Notre Dame and he's a motivational speaker and all that, right? <laughs> so it worked out well for him. But when he was 20 years old, there was no expectation of success. But he just went out and competed. So that's the Rudy analogy is perhaps a bit cliche, but it's fitting, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I, it's, there's so much about perspective. You know, to go back to your earlier question, just, I mean, here it's, it's sort of, uh, my goal is, my goals have changed. You know, I, I don't, I mean, the, the things that I used to be really competitive about, I mean, I, I grew up playing basketball and tennis and stuff like that. And, you know, it was just, it, they're, they're pretty easy to measure, right? You either, you get weeded out to a, at yes. some point. You can either, lose, right? you, can, you can keep playing this at a competitive level until you can't. And almost everyone in the entire world, they're done at, when college is over. Yeah. You don't just, you don't just keep playing competitively unless you're paying to do that at, at, after college. And so, you know, what, it's not like your fire dies. It's just what should you be competitive about and, and what should that mean for you? Because there's lots of things, there's lots of things to be competitive about. Just what's it gonna cost you to, to win and for, for what? That, that's a really interesting statement you just made there is that what's it gonna cost you to win or to compete at a really high level? Um, you see this all the time um, in, in athletic endeavors, but you know it's actually probably just as prevalent in sort of business or professional endeavors. Like I was talking to a guy today um, on the phone that's uh, Naval Academy grad, like stud, Marine, just kind of transitioned out and is looking to figure out what's, what's going to happen professionally at this point. And 
you know, my advice is always, you got to kind of figure out what you're trying to optimize against because maximal at a certain point in your life, it's rare that maximal is optimal. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And so like for me, I mean, take anything. If, if I'm trying to maximize income, that's not optimal for my life. There are a lot of things I can do, and it's a little unique now working in a small business, some of that stuff, but for the most part, even, even being a salesperson, maximizing income, for me anyway, was not optimal because that meant, I mean. Go could, trade bonds or something. Yeah, right, I could, go, I could go be an investment banker, or bond trader, or energy, you know, whatever, and I could probably maximize income, but that's not optimal for me. And so I can't be too competitive about income. I can't use that at this point as a measuring stick for how successful I am because I know that maximizing that is not optimal mm -hmm. for my life, you know? And it's the same, let's take, let's take a, a more basic example like fitness. Like me maximizing my ability to compete at CrossFit or maximizing my ability to deadlift, let's say, is not optimal because in order to maximize something like a deadlift, I've got to trade. You know, life is all about trade-offs and opportunity mm -hmm. costs, you know, and managing those. And you have to decide for yourself what you're okay with. And so if I allowed my competitiveness to say, like, I need to be able to deadlift as much as anybody at the gym, that's fine. But what am I willing to trade off for that? Is it, you know, my health in general? Because I, I would have to gain a ton of weight for one thing. Is it my ability to run and do other types of things? Like, there are just all these Jenny might not like it if you gain too much weight. You never know. Yeah, like I would right? not be attractive to my wife, which would be a huge problem. <laughs> Jenny, I love you. Whatever you need, I'm here for Trade-offs, you. Um, you know, some you're just not willing to make. Yeah, and so that that's actually, I mean, I really like the, the point you made about how being, being competitive at, at tennis or at powerlifting or any of those things, this is the reason that champions are such an interesting breed to, to study. Because whether they're like champions like of, of titans of industry and like CEOs of large companies or entrepreneurs that have like blown things up or competitive athletes, I mean, they, they're they trading things off. And I'm not saying that they're, they're making bad trade-offs or that I don't agree with their trade-offs or they don't work for them. But everyone should recognize that you don't get to the very top of the pile just on talent or just on luck. I mean, they're making at some point very conscious trade-offs like competitive athletes especially you you know like nflers right you you know that you are cashing in some longevity for your body like to be able to train and to, and to play and practice the way they do they are very obviously trading off an optimal sort of health and, and wellness lifestyle to get maximum performance whoa tom brady is gonna He's not going to agree with you. Tom versus time? Have you, have you, Tom versus about? time. Yeah. Tom's going to live forever is what Tom thinks. Just drink 27 gallons of water a day, you know, quadruple oxy oxygen infused or whatever. And well, so I'll disagree with you on that. And I would say Tom <laughs> would even say that, and I, I saw the, the first episode of the Tom versus time thing, and he basically said, look, if you're not willing to trade your life to, to beat me, then you're not going to beat me because I've basically traded my life to be as good as I am. So... He's making sacrifices too, whether it's family. He's time doing or, awesome. Or, and by the way, his his life seems awesome, so I'm sure it's okay. And, and Giselle M follows her on Instagram, not Tom so much, but follows her. And there was this great picture of of uh, Is she a good follow on Gis Instagram? Like 1.2 million, I think I saw. Like that she's hugging him in the tunnel after the after the game, and it's just sort of like, look, everyone's human, man. You know? You go out, you're gonna lose some stuff. You're gonna lose. And you know, he he puts it out there, he's 40 years old. It's awesome. He's out there still just winning. It's, yeah. it's really cool. You, you know? were talking about a competitive guy. Like he might be the, the prototypical competitor. Like, cause yeah. he, he has, didn't have sort of the talent, didn't have the pedigree, you know. Got it, picked, what, the sixth round, seventh round? Something like that. Seventh, seventh round, yeah. Last dude in the draft. Last dude in the draft? Yeah. yeah, I don't think he was Mr. Irrelevant, was he? He was the seventh round pick from the Patriots. Was he the last he pick the of, last the, of the draft? So, yeah, I mean, Great story there, obviously, but he is kind of the archetype of the of the competitor because he's not he's not just succeeding. He's not showing up at nine with a latte, right? No. He's there, giving it everything he has. And look, I was riding my bike into work this morning at eight fifteen, and life was pretty good. You know, I got a good night's sleep last night. Hung out with the girls, had some breakfast. Penny wake up once. Just, uh, Took care of it though. No big deal. Yeah. Easy, um, huh? 
But <laughs> but look, if I, I could have been on my way to the office at six, there would have been plenty to do. There's always plenty to do. I could have. Right? It's sort of so. We, like this is where it just but I'm it not evolves. Tom, I'm not Tom Brady. This is where it evolves, right? Because in the early days of Go Rock, it was, I mean, it was, this was 24 hours. I mean, when I'm sleeping, I'm dreaming about Go Rock. I wake up, start work, and work all day. And I did, you know, I did send Emily an email last just, night at about 12.10, so there's that, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it's just, you know, it, it's also has to, it also has to evolve because there's, there's more, there's more at stake, if you will, and mm-hmm. so you have to understand what your role is in life. If you're if you're kicking in doors, that's a lot different than if you're telling thousands of people to go kick in which doors. And so, you know, things like if you don't get a good night's sleep, if you don't take care of yourself, if you don't make good decisions, then all of a sudden you're you're telling you're you're able to in, you're able to impact a lot of change, but you're impacting change in all the wrong places. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I mean, that's been the, that's been a little bit of an arc for me over the last few years. That thread definitely runs through our our conversation last week about sort of being busy versus being productive and some of that. But I think a lot of folks, especially really competitive folks and high achieving folks struggle with the concept of sort of being able to slow down to speed up. I think that's the other thing. If you let your competitive nature drive you into sort of this frenzied activity um, you could be making trade-offs without even knowing it, you know, because you, you, you don't. It's hard to prove the counterfactual, so you don't know where the good night's rest or the work-life balance or just taking the time in a given workday to think deeply about a problem or to read a book, you know, to read the, uh, the soldier's load, you know, right or the yeah, right. Um, you don't know the ways in which those types of things are going to affect you downstream and might m- contribute massively to your success. And I, and I see this a lot with income, um, not to just always go back to that, but I, I know a lot of people, and being, being a West Point grad, I see this a lot. You look on LinkedIn at your classmates and you see people that are like partners at law firms and they're medical doctors or they've, they've done extremely well for themselves and it's, it's easy to look at that and say like, wow, what, what am I doing with my life? Or I should be here or there or, or whatever, and I, and I see a lot of folks that aren't willing to take a step back um, from a salary or from an income perspective because they just, you know, if you're making 85 now, even if you're miserable in your job and you're unhappy and there might be some other thing you want to achieve in life, they won't go to 65 to work in an industry or with people that could really accelerate their ability toward what they want, you know? Um, and I, it's the same, you get out of the army and you're making a certain amount of money so you don't want to make, you know, it's like there's just some uh, personal taboo that people have about ever making less mm-hmm. or less than they have before or they feel like it's a step back or they perceive it to be a lot less than their, their contemporaries. And I think that, that can be pretty, pretty limiting because there's a lot of opportunities out there that they don't, they don't occur in a linear fashion. Um, so, I mean, if you're, if you're too competitive about salary, even if it's only with yourself or, or, or title for that matter or any of those things, I mean, you could miss tremendous opportunities to be successful. And, and, and I've seen this, and I've been very guilty of this, frankly, on the physical and the, the athletic side. Um, you know, I could take a year off of like legitimate training, like intense training. If I took a year and only did yoga and like stretching and mobility, a whole year. In two years, I would be way further ahead of where I am now. <laughs> I think you're probably right. I, no, it's it's. A, I know it's true, but and I've known this for years, by the way. Yeah. But I have failed to implement. You don't like actually, yoga as much as garage thrasher shit. I don't. I don't. And part of it's because just the way it makes me feel and, and the sort of the mental aspect of it that I get. But part of it's also my competitive nature. So like I'm really working hard when I'm at the CrossFit gym to, if, to manage the, the load and the volume and some of these things so that I'm not hurting myself and it's stepping back. It's a thing, back. ask Bomber. Yeah, like, <laughs> like winning today's workout might, be, might feel great for a moment, but I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna continue to win in two years or in three years because I'm, I'm actually degrading my ability rather than advancing it. So 
That, that is the same professionally though. Yeah. And I, it's, it's a less obvious example, but I see it all the time. I talk to all kinds of dudes that are trying to figure out what to do. And by the way, advice is really easy to give when you're on the outside looking in. It's, it's very hard to take, but you're like, well, I don't know, man, just, just eat, eat black beans and rice for six months and go take less money to get yourself on the path you want to be on because this year you're going to make less than you made last year. But in three years or in five years, you might be making 5x what you made last year. But you're not if you just keep on the same path you're on now. Yep. And so that's where I think your competitive nature can actually inhibit your ability to be successful. Yeah, I mean, and, and this is, look, I, I did CrossFit a bunch in the early days. Oh, what was it? Oh, six. I mean, it was like when CrossFit was only the early, the early days, only, only functional fitness, yeah. you know, and it was sandbags and it was runs and rucks and pull up bars, push -ups, air squats, yeah. yeah, air squats, but that type of stuff. And, you know, what I've seen over the years is first off, the community of CrossFit is, is great. It's the best part about it is that these boxes are empowering people to, to be part of something bigger than themselves. The competitive part where it can get problematic comes in the forms of injury because people are competitive. Cuts both ways, right? It, it cuts, push, pushes you to be better, but it probably... The problem is, yeah. is when you, you're doing Olympic lifting for speed and maybe you wanna move a little faster, what's the only, you either have, you either have two options. Go back in time, get your time machine from Back to the Future, go back in time and train harder, right? And until that exists, I don't think it exists. Or two, break form and do the same thing and, and cut a corner to go a little faster. And so what people do is they, they, cut, a, they cut a corner to, to go a little faster to, to just sort of, you know, hey, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get my time on the wall or whatever, and they get injured. And that's, that's where com being competitive will also mess you up. Yeah, and that's the individual responsibility that I was just talking about, right? Yeah, and I, I know it and I acknowledge it in, in myself. And so that's I, where you've got you've to own your stuff and say, like, look, whether it's slowing down or reducing the load in a, in a CrossFit workout or whether it's working fewer hours to spend more time with your family because while well, you might maximize income this year, you're going to be divorced next year. Like, divorces are expensive, right? <laughs> there you go. Let me look. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Um, <laughs> yeah, so you're better <laughs> off taking the long play on some of these things and figuring out ways to where you can max, you know, you can leverage your competitive nature to make you persistent, determined, successful, but then also having the maturity and the, and the, the, you know, I get, I think just the person, the awareness to recognize ways that your competitive nature might be hindering your ability to grow or hurting you even in other ways. So whenever, I mean, and this is something I never would have done however however long ago, but you know, do, doing anything CrossFit-ish related, like the Rut Club battle, right? It's like, I, yeah, I'm We're just, doing burpees and push-ups. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's all different. of that stuff, right? When you start throwing weights in, like I'll, I'll do, you know, it's 45, 35 for whatever, it's 200, whatever the, the guy's girl's weight is. Like, I take half the girl's weight. I'm just, show up at the gym. But there's a lot of strong girls at these gyms, so you shouldn't feel badly about that. I, I don't, yeah. here's the thing, I don't feel badly about it. I'm, I'm really, really impressed for the people that can do anything remotely close to the weights that they're prescribing. But I just really don't, that's not my thing, right? Like, more weight. I'd rather just go a but little But you would faster. do it in another context though, right? So if we're rucking, if we're gonna do a five mile ruck after the show here, and the prescribed weight's 35 pounds, you wouldn't have any issue doing that or more, right? I would be fine with point. 35 pounds, sure. Yeah. I'm just not, haven't trained up enough to get to a point where doing whatever it is for however many reps over the course of 30 minutes is, is not gonna be injury inducing for me. Yeah. So. You're right. It's, it does go back to the sort of, you can either, you can either, I, I guess the third option is less weight, right? So the first option, back to the future time machine. Second option, cut form. Third, less weight. And yeah. the cutting, cutting weight thing, doing less weight is, it's harder. It's harder on your ego. 
Yeah. And the older I get, the less I care. It's like, you know, it's like you see your grandparents and they got sort of, you know, terrible shorts on and white socks pulled up to their whatever and whatever shoes that they, slippers They don't maybe, care what you think about and it. they don't give <laughs> a fuck, right? It's like, you know, I'm, I'm becoming that guy of, of some sorts. And just like, hey, I got my system worked out and it's good for me. I'm push myself where I want to and not where I don't. I've noticed that a lot about myself since we've, moved here to Jack's Beach and we started uh, working out at Black Hive because mm -hmm. no one no one knew me there when I showed up. And so, I mean, if, again, if I'm just being really honest, there was no expectation of my athletic ability at that gym because nobody knew me. And so I've, I've found it pretty easy, actually. And for the first time in my life, like I am regularly using a weight in a workout that is below the prescribed weight, um, even though I can I can do all the movements, but you know, if, if you're, if we're like barbell cycling 185, you know, I'm not going to do a, a, a bunch of reps of clean and jerk at 185. I'll just, I'm happy to do 135 or whatever the case may be. I, I have no problem with it. And, uh, you know, three years ago, four years ago, it would have been like, hey man, you did really great in that workout. And I'd have been like, yeah, but I scaled it. So it doesn't count. Yeah. You know, like, but, and then I became a coach and I started like having to tell all my athletes, like, Hey, you did great. And they're like, yeah, but I scaled. I'm like, don't you say that shit to me. You did great. Scaling is not <laughs> failing, you know? It's not a character assessment. And then I had to almost sort of just hear myself saying it to other people to take my own advice. And then that combined with being in a new environment where there were no external expectations of me, which as much as I would like to, I would like to say that other people's expectations of my performance don't really affect me, you know, whatever, but like they do. You know, if, you, if, if you're at a gym where people know you and they know, you can clean and jerk 185 and you're choosing to do 30 pounds less or 50 pounds less than that, then you're kind of like wondering that they're hey, like, if it's going to hey, help you, shamming over there. if it's going to help, I'll call Brent right when we get off this and I'll tell him that you've been shamming and <laughs> he needs to really ratchet up the That's pressure it. on you, right? <laughs> That's clearly it. That's it right there. <laughs> oh man. But it's, it's been really, it's been helpful for me because I, I came into it a little banged up and I've stayed pretty healthy and I've stayed pretty active and I haven't missed a lot of days or missed a lot of workouts because I've been hurt or injured or too sore because isn't that the goal you live to fight another day isn't you know? that the goal right I mean multiple things all over the place right lift some lift some heavy weight do some miles do some push-ups whatever lots of different things bike to work yeah yeah so competition what else? competition well, oh yeah, capitalism. oh yeah, but here, here's a plug. Way. <laughs> here's a plug for you. So we're we're doing this 50 miler in DC, May 18th and 19th. Are we do, are we for sure doing this? I'm doing it. Okay. I think you're doing it, right? <laughs> okay. I'm, well, if you're doing it, I'm doing yeah. it. It's May 18th and 19th. Teams of two to five. You got 20 hours to what do was it? it. May 18th and 19th. 18th and 19th. Starts, I think, Friday at 2100, 9 p.m. In... Cut off is what, 5 p.m. the next day? Yep. So it's teams of two to five, and you've got 20 hours to earn the patch. You'll have 20 pound ruck plate or the equivalent on your back in your ruck. And, you know, I mean, part of it is I wanna do really well. I wanna, I wanna push myself. That, that's where the sort of, hey, this is about fighting mm. the fight. Right, a part of me it's about wants stoking to, the fire. Yeah, too, right? I mean, you like, got it. You know, if you you know if you left it all out on the field, mm -hmm. you know if you sort of quit a little earlier, if you just didn't because you know whatever excuse you came up with in your own head. And so, you know, we're gonna do that, and we're gonna see where that goes. Maybe do it some other cities as well. But I don't know. Is it gonna be competitive, or it'll be some form of? It's not absolutely individual competitive there's going to be one champion but i'm going to try if, however many people are on finishing will be an accomplishment finishing is a big accomplishment Any, but I also anyone want to finish who, fast anyone who holds that patch will have earned it yeah. without question right? yeah so so the idea is it's sort of modeled after the star course it's like an urban star course basically right so we're going to have a start point and then you'll get your next point and it will be however far away and at that point you get your next point Right? Or no, you, we'll actually you, just give them the... Okay, so you have all your points. Yeah. And they're going to get all their... It's and just you map out your route. Yeah, you map out your route. So you've got to sort of... You're given your waypoints that you've got to hit at the, at the start point, And you've got to plan your route at that point. So, you know, there's a really long movement down the Sino Canal. You can either 
do that first or you can do that last. When, when's a good time to do that? I don't know. So the event is going to be in DC, May 18th, 19th. Yep. A little competitive, a little bit of teams of two to five. A little bit of sort of, hey, survive it, and that's awesome. Yeah. That's its own competition. To earn your patch, you'll, you'll have to hit all your waypoints within 20 hours yep. overnight, and it will be 50-ish miles. F minimum 50. To finish. Yeah. And when will people know more about this and be able to sign up for it? Andy? Wednesday, <laughs> I heard. I heard it's the launching on Wednesday. We'll post it on the SCAR page, too. Okay. Soon. Yeah. Soon. Soon. We have to get our act together a little bit on this and then... Great. It's not on Andy. We, we probably... Great. Yeah. yeah. But it'll be a good time. Jason and I will be there. We'll be a team. And then... Um, probably have some more people on our team, right? Well, we'll see how many people we can talk five. into it. Does anyone want to walk 50 miles? I mean, 50 mile ruck? Making? It's rucking 50 miles. <laughs> you can walk it, but you won't earn your patch. You have to ruck it. Cool. Speaking of events, the, um, the survival series stuff, the, the immersion water survival... Expedition Wilderness Survival, that's going to be available for sign up real soon, right? That's, you tell me. Tomorrow? <laughs> or Monday? We're going to work, I'll tell you You're what, me hanging. it's Is either it going to be Monday? tomorrow or we're going to work all weekend and make sure it's up on Monday. That's what's so cool about it. They're coming. They're coming. And they're going to be worth it. <laughs> Bomber. Yes. Questions. Got some cool shit. Y'all just Bring answered it in. Dan's question. He asked about that immersion events. There you go. So a few people have pinged about that. Um, just Get a lot of sideways looks from Andy back here behind the camera. Great. <laughs> Luke MC, who his team, uh, the one of two. His stack team that he yes. spent, you know, training. six months training and cultivating that, that according to Blaine, lost to Blaine. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, Blaine ate. He ate one of his. I ate one teammates. of my teammates and still finished yeah. in first place. Yeah. Know. Well, his um, his crew did a fifty miler uh, for the GBF Foundation. Well, then we'll when expect we'll to see you in DC so on May eighteenth. They're good to go. Or Maybe whenever we come to Florida, probably do one here at some point. We got to right. Have yeah. to. Home and all. St. Augustine and back. Yeah, St. Augustine and back on the beach. Oh. <laughs> Heather Williams, which for some other reason she um, texts me instead of messaging on Facebook. Or well, you guys are like the, tight like that. Oh, yeah, texting. Texting. Yeah. She also, she's doing a, she's our liaison for the Travis Banyan 5K and one mm -hmm. model that we're going to host here later on in the year. She and her and a few others have asked about the, this is about competition, this conversation. But they want to know how that ties in with the uh, regular, like a Go Ruck Tough, that's a team-based event and instead of a competitive event. So a couple things. It's a, it's a really good question. I think that our goal in those events, and Jason, you jump in here at any point if I'm off base. Our goal in those events is to, to forge a team. The cadre's mission is to take these folks, push them to their limits, and, and by the end of the event, to have them forged as a team. So... It doesn't mean there can't be some competitive things. That, I mean, I did a, I remember doing a, my first light, actually. We were broken up into groups, and we did like a relay thing with PT and stuff. So that one, and it was really fun, by the way, competing and kind of doing that. So I'm good to have a little bit of friendly competition thrown into the events, but I, I don't think that's the goal of those particular events. Yeah, I mean, you've got to sort of take some of your past training and apply it to that. So... You know, what's the role of competition? I mean, it goes back to our, our roots in special forces, right? I mean, in, when you go on a mission, you are one team. One team, one fight, right? But to get to that mission, there's lots of competition that breeds excellence. And so, you know, you, you put those two together to be a great teammate, you got to first be a great individual. You need to set some bars and you need to compete against yourself or the time or the, the I mean, when I was in college, I would go, my, I started getting all banged up because I was running too much. And I'd, so I started swimming. And I'd go to the big pool in, uh, on campus. And I would just, wherever I, whatever lap I was on, I would pick someone random across the pool next to me, whatever. Sometimes give them a big head start, sometimes less of a head start. And I would compete with them every single lap, right? For however long until I you know, was done for that day. It was usually you know, quite a bit. And it's sort of the competition made me better. 
But the point is, is you can always find something that's going to sharpen your edges a little bit that makes you a better team mate, team member. So what we're getting at is, hey, we can evolve some events or some portions of some events to say, we'll throw a little bit of competition into it, or, or in this case, we'll make it entirely competitive within a team environment. It's nuanced, right? And everybody sort of wins in that. By the way, I swam in a pool with you one time, and you said we're going to swim for, I forget how many minutes it was. Yeah. And I'd have a watch on, so I was just swimming, and you were in the lane next to me, and I was just kind of pacing with you, and you were a little bit ahead of me most of the time, and we were pretty much even, and then on the... We got down to the end of the pool, and then all, you, kicked, you kicked off the wall, and we're gunning it on a lap. And I'm like, oh, wow, look at him go all of a sudden. And then we get to the final wall, and you finish you know, a body length or two ahead of me. And you're like, that's it. Our time's up. And I'm like, body length I'm or like, two. that mother. <laughs> AKA he, half the length of the pool. He, he, got had, it. he had a watch on and, <laughs> and gunned it in the final the final. Yeah, then length. I had to hear all these stories about, I haven't swam that much since I was a cadet at West Point, and all these other... <laughs> Tears that, started that rolling down your lies. face. Those are all lies. <laughs> <laughs> but in case you're wondering if Jason was competitive. <laughs> also, let me say this about the Travis Manion Foundation. We're, um, we're doing kind of a lot with them. So uh, not only is the Jack's Beach uh, 9-11 Heroes run, we're, we're going to race direct it. Like we're kind of taking on that and we're going to get it set up and do packet pickup here at, at the PX and provide volunteers and really try to make the race here in Jack's Beach awesome for the 9-11 Heroes run. So we're stoked about that. But uh, also, uh, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say this yet or not, Heather, but here we go. All of the Travis Mannion 9-11 Heroes runs in 2018 are gonna have a rucking division. So if you hate running, like a lot of people do, but you still wanna go out and support a great cause and be part of the TMF 9-11 Heroes run, you will have an opportunity to ruck this year. So all you ruckers out there, all you folks in the Go Ruck community, go out and support this event when it comes up in September. And you don't have to run, you can ruck. And as an added bonus, if you join the rucking division and you ruck, we've designed a really sweet patch that's got the TMF kind of Spartan helmet logo mm, cool. and the Go Ruck logo. So we're excited about what they're doing. We're very happy to support it. And uh, you guys can look forward to that coming up later this summer. Um, Howland's Hopeless, Pingus, they said if there's a Ruck Club battle up their way, that they would love to challenge James Reeland's uh, crew down in Detroit Ooh. and Brian Singlin's crew, the Cleveland area rucking crew. Mm. So, glad to see some calling part out of the country, going on. That's yeah. good. The old Midwest Ruck Club battle. Yeah. I don't hate that. I love the Midwest. I'm, of course, I'm from there. I'm a little biased myself, but. Anyway, go ahead. Uh, Matt was recommending in 2018 selection that we have a. Uh, I love recommendations about selection yeah. for stuff. <laughs> combatives. Combatives. Yeah, yeah combatives. Yeah, yeah, let's combatives. definitely do that. Against the cadre at the 47 hour <laughs> mark, right? The other. <laughs> <laughs> I like my chances there. But yeah. They did. So, the, uh, another story about combatives. Um, at, at Ranger School for a period, they started, you know, those handheld tasers? Not like the ones where you shoot somebody with it, but the one where you just you know, like hit somebody with it, bzz, you can taste somebody with a handheld taser. They started introducing those in the combatives pit because the, the word got out that at Ranger School you just sham during combatives because the last thing you want to do is like get hurt, you know. So whoever you're fighting, you just make an agreement like, hey, let's just not go too hard here because we don't want to get hurt. <laughs> and so what they did um, when I was there is they they would introduce a taser to every bout, and so you'd bet you'd line up back to back in the sawdust pit, and then the cadre, the RI, would have the option of doing whatever he wanted to with this taser. So he'd in some cases he would slide it in like the cargo pocket of one of the the Rangers. Nice. In other cases, he would like throw it on the ground off to the side or like drop it down between your backs or whatever. But as soon as the taser and like whoever got, it was like, as if, like it was a knife or something, right? Whoever got tased lost the fight. Hmm. And you want to talk about ramping up the intensity on a combatives fight. Just throw a taser in the mix and say whoever gets tased loses. So you heard it here first, tasers, 2018 yeah. selection. Yeah, uh, tasers. Awesome. At the 47 hour mark against the cat. <laughs> the sh the, sh the right. shark attack's gonna be a taser fight. <laughs> uh, Neil asked the percent of GoRuck customers that do not do events. Oh man. No events, GoRuck, I don't know. There, that number exists, but. So people that buy a ruck or buy a piece of apparel that have never done an event, is that the idea? Right. I don't know what it is. 60? I have the too high. I mean, I, I don't know. Feel the like we're doing some Kentucky wins. I don't. I don't right know the now. answer. 
I'm like on Shark Tank right now and I don't know my numbers. Mr. Wonderful would not be happy. Yeah. I don't, I don't know that number. But in general terms, there are a significant number of people that have bought a rock or bought a piece of apparel that haven't done a, a challenge. Sure. Yeah, yeah. It's like, you know, and every GRT out there who's like, 60, man, they need to get out there and earn it. It's like, guys, these are the people you tell Goruk about, right? It's okay. It's like my, it's like, you know, my grandmother and stuff. It's okay. Yeah, my parents right? both own rocks and they've never done a Goruk <laughs> challenge. And I would love for them to someday, it's okay. but like, it's also awesome to have them as part of the community. Yeah, and they're out there rocking. rocking. It's good. I talked to my dad the other day on the phone. He's telling me he got these, he's got these great, he made these weights out of some jars of stuff that he had and so they were able to measure and figure out how they get 10 pounds in their ruck or 15 pounds in their ruck and my mom are all squared away now and they're out with the hey, ruckers Brian, do, do i need to like get your dad's address and send him some ruck plates God, they're pretty him, awesome no because then it would take away his opportunity to figure out how to make he could be out rucking weight. instead of making the perfect weight you don't take don't take that from him okay he's <laughs> retired now i just want him earning his keystone lights bro you know you just throw, a, just throw an 18-pack of Keystone Light in that thing, and your problems are solved, right? Just walk over to the yep. Dollar General. And yep, Dollar General. What do they cost there, about like 10 nothing. bucks? They're, I think they give them pack. away. I think they're yeah. free, <laughs> as they should be. We had a Miss Lindsay Miller that oh, reached man. out. She said sure third her. and sixth place. She also said Jason. Third and sixth. Oh, third yeah. and sixth. She said, Jason, how great was your team leader during the Battle of the My team leader was awesome. The best. Yeah, okay. Lindsay, was, Lindsay was awesome. We, we had a lot of, so here's, I guess, since we're talking about competition. This is one of those things where at a certain point I realized we weren't going to win. We weren't going to win any of the iterations. We weren't going to, it just wasn't going to happen. And, you know, it became about, hey, let's have fun and let's make sure we give it our all. And, you know, Part of me hates that, but but the older I get, you know, now I'm sort of thinking I had a I had a blast. It was awesome. Okay, how was your day Saturday? It was right? awesome. Me too. Yeah. Right? I mean, that's the thing, right? I got to know several people from the office that were on my team, that were on Lindsay's team, I should say, a little <laughs> bit more, and got to do something fun together, and it was great. So, you know, I mean, sure, it's great to show up and just you know be Michael Jordan in Game Six against the Jazz, but. You know, that doesn't really happen very often. Sometimes, sometimes you just got to have your day that, Jason. Sometimes you just got to, you know, show up and do body drags and, right, like lose at most things. And it happens, but at least you beat someone else, right? Fair enough. <laughs> it's all subjective. Yep. What else? Had a GRT from back home that did his first event with David Sherrard. He's a LEO that lost his life in the line of duty. That's a GRT that actually his first event was one that Dave, uh, Dave Lyles did with you, Jason. Yeah. And there's a it's lot of uh, heavy hitters at that event. It was in Dallas. Yeah, it was, it was B. Uh, Yang's first event, I think, right? Yeah. I remember that event. I remember that event really well because it was uh, some, some of the folks from the Green Bay Foundation were there. And the chairman of the board was general champion on the Green Bay Foundation. And his son was uh, an officer in the Dallas SWAT department. And so this was the guy who was that he brought with him. And there were several of them, five or six, if, if I'm not mistaken. And so he, David was one of the guys who was there, who did the event. And I just remember their crew was great, you know, They're, as you would expect, you know, lots yeah. of smiles, carry more than their, more than their fair share and sort of do it right. So that was kind of a bad, not kind of, that, that was a, a, that was a really bad bit of news. Yeah, so he was a police officer in Richmond, Texas got called like to, to domestic basically at an apartment yeah. complex, right? And got shot. Um, that's, that's a sobering reminder that our, our law enforcement officers out there are on a daily basis going into situations where they don't know uh, how dangerous they are, but they just do it every day over and over yeah. and over again. And uh, that's just a, a bit of a bitter reminder of, of the work they do. So certainly appreciate it. Yeah. That's all I got. Well, sorry to end on a somber note, but I think it's appropriate. So yeah. thanks, guys. We'll see you next time. <laughs>